Welcome back to Crown on Canvas, the tutors in art and history. In this season of Accessible Art History, the podcast, we're using portraits to explore the magnificent and sometimes maligned Tudor dynasty. From Henry VII to Elizabeth I, this family ruled England for 118 years. And don't forget, the six wives of Henry VIII will cover them too. Each episode has an accompanying blog post, so make sure to check it out using the link in the show notes. We can't wait to go on this exciting art historical journey with you. Welcome back to Accessible Art History, the podcast. On this episode of Crown and Canvas, we're continuing our discussion on the life and reign of Henry VIII. We last left off with Henry approaching the middle of his reign. In this episode, we will continue the story, and as many of you know, this is where things start to get a little bit crazy. So to learn more, keep on listening. In this week's episode, we're going to look at a portrait of Henry VIII from 1531. Painted by Joseph van Cleef, its composition is nearly identical to a portrait of King Francis I of France that the artist also completed around this time. Art historians believe that this was intentional because the pair were done in commemoration of the magnificent field of cloth of gold event that I discussed in the last episode. Compared to the last portrait we discussed, Henry has matured considerably. His face is more rounded and a beard now covers his chin. His clothing is absolutely stunning and steals the show. The dark brown fur is offset by intricate cloth of gold details. The viewer can assume that the cream-colored linen undershirt is made from the finest material available. Finally, Henry's outfit and fingers are covered in jewels. It's certainly a fit for one of the most powerful kings in Europe. One of the most fascinating details of the painting is in the scroll that the king holds. On it, the translated words read, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16.15 This is a nod to the fact that Henry VIII was given the title Defender of the Faith by the Pope in 1521. We'll discuss that in a little bit. Overall, the rich outfit, authoritative pose, and sense of grandeur all combined in this portrait of Henry VIII to create a visual story highlighting his power and importance in 16th century Europe. Now that we have an image of Henry VIII in our mind, let's jump back into his biography. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the king was given the title the Defender of the Faith in 1521. This honor was conferred by Pope Leo X as a quote, thank you for Henry's essay book, Astertio Septum Sacramentorum, or Defense of the Seven Sacraments. In this, Henry wrote in defense of the supremacy of the Pope and the importance of the Holy Sacrament of Marriage. On one quick side note, this is a little bit ironic, knowing what comes later in the king's life. But why did Henry feel the need to write this book? Well, to answer that question, we have to rewind about four years. On October 31st, 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther pinned 95 theses to the door of his local church in Württemberg, Germany. The majority of them had to do with the sale of indulgences and how people don't necessarily need the intervention of priests or the church to achieve salvation. This was a huge controversy in 16th century Europe. For the majority of history, the Catholic Church had an essential monopoly on the faithful. But now someone was questioning this authority, and it was a big deal. Martin Luther, in one swift move, started the Protestant Reformation. As a devout Catholic, this didn't sit well with Henry, so he wrote his treaty to inform the world exactly what he thought about this Protestant upstart. Next, we're going to talk about the beginning of Henry VIII's own Reformation, but first, let's take a quick break. Hi there, my name is Annalisa, and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that's curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways you can support my cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support accessible art history monetarily. However, I commit to always bringing my work for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening to today's episode and keep an eye out for more art history content from Accessible Art History. All right, now that we're back, let's talk about one of the most infamous figures in history, Anne Boleyn. As the daughter of a minor noble, Anne's early life is a bit of a mystery. We'll cover it more in depth in her own episode coming soon, but it's important to know that she was raised and trained in the court of King Francis I of France. When she was a young woman, her father, Thomas Boleyn, recalled her from France to return home to Hever Castle in Kent. Her family was rising through the ranks of court, and Thomas wanted his daughter nearby to help make it an advantageous marriage. Her sister Mary was the mistress of King Henry VIII, meaning that they were in a prime position for a power grab. However, soon, Henry became bored with Mary and cast her aside. Historians don't know exactly when Anne caught his eye, but it was likely around the early months of 1526. He was absolutely smitten with her and pursued her relentlessly. But Anne was savvy. She refused to become his mistress, especially seeing how he had so easily cast aside her sister. After a year or so of keeping him at arm's length, Henry decided it was time to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne. Henry VIII petitioned Pope Clement VII for an annulment in 1527. He based it on a verse from Leviticus 20.21, which forbade a man from marrying his brother's wife. 
In Henry's mind, this should have been an easy petition to grant. In fact, over the centuries, popes had annulled royal marriages on much shakier grounds. But unfortunately for Henry, this was not the case this time around. The same year as the petition, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V sacked the city of Rome and took the pope captive. Charles V also happened to be Catherine of Aragon's nephew. This definitely threw a wrench in Henry's plans. Over the next few years, Henry and his ministers worked to get the Pope to annul the marriage. But when it became clear that this would not happen, the king decided to take matters into his own hands. He turned to two men, Thomas Cramner and Thomas Cromwell, to help him. Both were Protestant and created a convincing argument that Henry wasn't necessarily subject to papal jurisdictions. This meant that he didn't need the Pope to grant him a divorce. Henry took this idea and ran with it. He appointed Cramner, a clergyman, to the lofty position of Archbishop of Canterbury. As the highest-ranking churchman in the country, Cramner had the power to quickly grant Henry VIII to his divorce. This was important because, technically, Henry had committed bigamy. In the early months of 1533, he had married Anne Boleyn upon finding out that she was pregnant with his child. It was crucial that this child be born legitimate, as they would be the new heir to the throne. By May 1533, Cramner had ensured that Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine was officially over, and legitimized his marriage to Anne. A month later, the new queen was crowned in a lavish ceremony in Westminster Abbey. These events jump-started the English Protestant Reformation. With Henry VIII officially breaking from the church and declaring himself the head of the Church of England, the religious landscape of the country had changed forever. In 1534, these acts were solidified in the Acts of Supremacy, and for the next six years, the crown systematically dismantled monasteries across the country. All of their property became property of the crown, some of which Henry gave to his loyal followers for their support. These moves would have massive implications for the rest of the Tudor period and beyond. On September 7th, 1533, Anne Boleyn gave birth to a healthy baby girl. She was named Elizabeth for both of her grandmothers and had her father's signature red hair. However, despite being born healthy, Henry was disappointed that Elizabeth was a girl. He had staked the soul of his nation, betting on the birth of a male heir. But Anne worked to assure him that the birth of one healthy child was a good sign that a boy would soon follow. However, over the next three years, this did not happen. Anne miscarried twice, and soon Henry began to have doubts, once again, in his choice of wife. But he knew he had to do things differently this time around. He was already 45 years old and only had two daughters to show for it. So Henry turned to his ministers to concoct a plan. Cromwell, one of Henry's closest statesmen, had had a falling out with Anne, fueling his own desire to replace her with a queen that would be more pliable to his ideas. On May 2, 1536, Anne Boleyn was arrested on charges of adultery and plotting to kill the king. A group of her male friends, including her own brother George, were also arrested on charges of adultery slash incest with the queen. The group did go through a trial, but it was all for show. Henry and Cromwell knew from the outset that she and the others had to be executed as a show of power and to ensure there would be no obstacles in Henry's way for a third marriage. Just over two weeks after her arrest, Anne Boleyn was executed. Historians speculate that Henry felt at least something left for her at the end because he sent for an expert swordsman from France to perform the execution, which ensured that her death would be relatively painless and swift. According to witnesses, her last words were a repeated prayer, Jesu receive my soul, O Lord God, have pity on my soul. Within a couple of weeks, Henry married Anne's lady-in-waiting, Jane Seymour. But this part of the story will have to wait until the next episode. The last 11 years of Henry's life were certainly tumultuous and should make for an interesting discussion. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode. Remember to check out the blog post linked in the show notes for images and sources. New episodes come out on Fridays, so make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for updates. Until then, happy listening.